Hey guys, welcome back. It's the Advanced Photo Manipulation Movie Poster Effects course. My name is Kirk Nelson, and we are now on Lesson 3. And in this lesson, we will be going over the basic setup for this project. So here we are in Photoshop, and let's begin with a new file. Now, when we use the term movie poster, we are normally referring to what's known in the industry as the one sheet. And there's a pretty standard size for that one sheet. It is usually 27 inches wide by 40 inches tall. The resolution is 300 because it is a printed material. Now, this does generate a very large file. And for the purposes of this course, the working files that we have are probably about a quarter of this size, simply because I didn't want to bog down the file sizing of the packages that we need to deliver to you for the course files. So all the techniques and elements are still true. It's just the file size is shrunk down to be about a quarter of what it would actually need to be were you creating a real movie poster one sheet. Now, since this course isn't really dealing heavily with the mechanics behind generating the poster, I am not really going to delve into things like title safe and action safe. I do want to mention that if you were to actually print this out, it would be necessary to build in what's known as a bleed around the edges. So you would want to size the poster up just slightly, even if it's just a quarter of an inch larger, so that the printer would have a trim area to trim it off, so that, that way you would get the printing all the way to the edges of the paper. But again, we are not concerning ourselves heavily with the mechanics of it right here. This is, of course, on the effects of creating the image. So I've scaled down this canvas image, and the new size that I'm going to be working with is about... 1,975 pixels wide by 2,939 pixels high. That is the same dimensions as the regular full-size one sheet. So proportionally, it's the same. It's just significantly smaller so that we save some room on file sizing. Okay, so at this point, we need to select a background to begin with. Here I have the mini bridge open, and we will go through and start looking at some of the backgrounds that we have available to use. Now I'm particularly partial to this file here, this 0680. So I'm gonna open that up. Now what I like about this one is that it does have plenty of room to position a robot in here. It's got plenty of city looking elements. So I'm going to pull that background over onto our working file here. Notice that it's kind of crooked. So I'm going to pull out a couple of lines so that I can adjust the horizon to make sure it's nice and straight and to finally position this file in a way that I think will work for this poster. Okay, a couple things to pay attention to. Not only that the verticals appear vertical and the horizontals are horizontal, but also that we're at least mindful of the rule of thirds. If we pull up our crop tool, we can see where these lines of thirds are going. And sometimes it's really helpful just to go ahead and drop some guidelines in there so that we can keep track of our action and how it's working out in a line with those guides. Let's pull open one of our figure images. Let's see, I wanna start with this one here, number 11. Because I like the positioning of his body here with the exception of this leg. I think I'm going to swap out that leg with one of the other ones, number 18. Yeah, I like the positioning of that leg better, but I don't like the positioning of the body in this one. It looks like he's taking a, a punch to the gut or something. He's doubled over. This is a much stronger stance and I believe a, a better overall figure pose, but I just need to swap out that leg. So with this one open, I'm going to grab my pen tool, set it to path, and start using the pen to go around and select the figure. Oh, I want to have this set to combine shapes as we go through. We've got the entire outline of the figure traced along with the pen tool to create a path. Let's double click the background layer to turn it into a regular layer. So that way we can use that path as a vector mask through layer vector mask current path. 
that outlines that well. Notice I clipped out this right leg here because I'm going to do the same thing with only the leg on this file. Okay, so we've got the leg cut out here. We will drag that over and deposit it on this one and position it into place. Okay, so we've got the figure posed as we like it. Let's create a merged layer of these two. So I've got both the layers selected and I'm going to press Control, Alt, and E. That is Command, Option, E on a Macintosh. And I can hide those original layers because now I have this merged layer here that I'm going to work with. Now, I like the use of this figure for not only proportions, but also the lighting. I like the way the lighting is falling around the rounded elements, and that's something that's very useful to use later on in the project. But what's not useful is some of the details of this figure, things like the wood grain, the screw heads, the little cuts in the wood. Those are not things that are going to work well on a giant robot. I mean, I know the screws probably will, but it looks like it's a tiny screw on a piece of wood, not a large metallic gear. So what we're going to do is get rid of those details while still keeping the general lighting and form of the figure. And we will do that through the surface blur filter. So filter, blur, surface blur. I'm going to set the radius up to about 15. And you can see in the preview window how that's doing a good job of removing those fine details, but still keeping the shading information. Keep the threshold at about 15 as well. Okay, so now we've got a much cleaner looking figure, but it's still not quite to a point that we can use it because we still need to clean up some of the other small areas. Like I mentioned before, that screw head that's in there. Let's just grab that and use Content Aware Fill to remove that. So that's through the Fill dialog box, which can be found in the Edit menu, and you set the use to Content Aware. And that easily gets rid of that. We can do the same with the other screw heads. Okay, so at this point I've gone through and removed all those traces of the smaller details and only left in the details that might contribute to the appearance of a giant metal robot. Things like some of the seams in the wood might be useful, but we'll see later on. So at this point, I also need to take away the color information because robots aren't generally wooden colored. The best way to do that in Photoshop is really with the black and white adjustment filter because it allows you the greatest degree of control over the shades of gray that result from the different color values within the image. Now from doing this before, I learned that this maximum black preset works really well for the type of lighting that I want in this image. I want a nice backlit area with some rich shadows along the front because that matches with the scene that we're working with. All right, so now once we have the color information adjusted like we want it to, it's time to create another merged layer just like before by selecting the two layers and pressing Control, Alt, and E or Command, Option, E. So that gives us this full figure here. Now, once we deposit that figure over into the scene, by necessity, we are going to want to isolate some of the different elements of it. So really, it's a good idea to go ahead and do that now. For instance, we already have a selection made for this leg when we did the cutout before on the left leg. So I just control clicked on that mask to create that selection, and then on this merged layer, press Control or Command J to make a copy of that leg from there. And we will call that right leg. And then the general idea is to just go ahead and do that for each of these elements. Okay, so I've got each of these elements duplicated onto their own layer. I've separated the lower torso from the upper torso, each leg, the head, and then each arm individually. Plus we have the base figure that we began with. And I put all these into a single group that I called figure cutout. 
and then we'll take this entire group and deposit it into our project. And then because it's a group, we can now size it and position it all as a single element where we want it within the scene. Now at this point, I want to be particularly careful about where the feet are going. So I want to pay attention to the depth of the scene. So to my mind, I think this foot over here would be somewhere near that parking lot, maybe next to that parked car. And this foot here would be a little bit further back, probably in front of that parking garage, yet behind these trees and the car over there anyway. Now, I realize that that could be a bit of a challenge to make it feel like that those feet are going to be sticking on that ground behind all those elements, which is why we have some other tricks later on to pull. Things like using smoke and debris to cover up that intersection there so it doesn't become quite so obvious as to how difficult it is to put things together like that. Also, I do know that the head is intersecting with the top of the frame here. I don't expect to use this head as its full form here because that really does just tip people off to saying, hey, that's a drawing mannequin. We want it to look more like a robot. So we will be reshaping the head so it won't be quite so tall and elongated. It'll be a little more squat. All right, guys, that's it for lesson three. We've completed the basic setup for this project. So now with the next lesson, we can really start digging in to some more in-depth type of photo manipulation. And we will begin with using the puppet warp to position and change the appearance of that mannequin model so it looks a little more like a robotic figure that we need.